Well, if you haven't heard, the King is sticking around L.A. for at least a couple more seasons as LeBron James has agreed to a two-year, $104 million max extension to remain with the purple and gold. That has been confirmed by our NBA insider Bill Ryder. The extension includes a player option and a no-trade clause for LeBron, who is heading into his 22nd NBA season, a season in which he will turn 40 years old in December. Welcome here to CBS Sports HQ. Haley Sutton alongside our NBA analyst Brad Bodkin. Brad, we've been talking about this all day. The buzz in L.A. is LeBron James is sticking around for a few yeah. more years. Uh, but when you look at the Lakers as a whole, right, this mm -hmm. is a team with high expectations as the years have gone on, and yet they haven't really been able to build around LeBron the way they've maybe wanted to. you got AD in there, a couple of other young players. So when it comes to the Lakers, what are they missing? Why have they not been able to get this sort of dynasty? <clears throat> done over the last couple of years it's a it's a layered question um, you talk about the buzz of LeBron's contract really the buzz is bad they were hoping he was gonna take less money because they were gonna get somebody with the money that was left over so they have struck out on on these pursuits of quote third stars in my opinion they have overemphasized trying to bring in the star power they tried with Russell Westbrook um, they're all about the big, splashy, quote, third star, and they have done so at the expense of properly filling out their support staff. When they won the championship in 2020, uh, you had guys like Contavious Caldwell Pope, Alex Caruso, Dwight Howard on the offensive glass. They were properly outfitted with the proper amount of defensive versatility, those role players that fill all the gaps, and that made them a championship team, and then they didn't prioritize that moving forward. They cheaped out on Alex Caruso, they let Pope go, uh, and that starts to chip away at LeBron James and Anthony Davis's ability uh, to do really any more than they did last year. I mean, they, they gave everything they had last year I don't know how many games Davis missed, but it wasn't many. And that's not, in terms of durability, can he repeat that? Can LeBron, at his age, keep playing the number of games he played last year at the level he played at? Um, probably not. So they have struck out in filling out the periphery of that roster with the types of players that can allow them to compete for championships. They had them in-house, and they didn't prioritize keeping them after 2020, and they never been able to regain them. Yeah, to your point, just two playoff series won since they won it all back in 2020. They did win the play the play or the in season tournament, I should say, this That's, year, which was it's a sad day. And when they're hanging <laughs> in season tournament banners in in Lakerland, it's no good. <laughs> Let me ask you this though, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but and it, it's still early, right, in free agency. Do you think the Lakers have gotten any better since working out this deal with LeBron? I mean, I know they're still trying to bring in guys. What can they do to improve so that they can avoid what we've seen over the last couple of years no they're they're running out of options I mean this this landscape dries up very quickly as everybody starts signing other places and then they were, we were holding out what appears to be some false hope for DeMar DeRozan there's now reporting that Miami is the the favorite to land him we'll see where he ends up but uh, no there's not a lot of uh, first of all they're over the second apron right now so if, if LeBron uh, is going to restructure that contract. I think his number is 104 million right now. He could trim a couple million off, get that below the second apron, and maybe get into a sign and trade somewhere. I mean, they're pulling some levers right now. We're trying to, as we speak, they're crunching numbers. But in the Western Conference, there's not really a neutral ground. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. It, it's such a competitive conference, and all these teams have gotten better. Uh, Oklahoma City got way better. Uh, the Pelicans added DeJounte Murray. Um, Memphis is going to be back. They were out of the talk last year. They're going to be back. So the Lakers are once again right there in play-in situation just because they didn't get any better. Look, in, especially for the Lakers, but for any team, if your two biggest off-season acquisitions are your coach <laughs> and your best player's kid, it's, it's no, no, they did not get better and their opportunities to get better are very quickly drying up. Along those same lines, you know, it's not just the players who, you know, have been impact here. You've got, you know, um, Dan Hurley said no to the coaching mm. job. Clay Thompson, who has, you know, a family legacy with the Lakers mm. said no. I mean, what's wrong with the Lakers? Because in my opinion, especially growing up, you know, the Lakers were the Lakers and the Celtics. Those were the premier teams that you wanted to root for, that you wanted to watch, that you uh, wanted to play for. So what is it about the Lakers right now that is not allowing for them to build? 
Yeah, that's a, a good question and a long topic. Um, <laughs> I don't know that necessarily, you know, I think there's some front office instability in terms of uh, Rob Palenka is the guy with his name on all the moves, but like there's like six or seven people with their hand on some switches in that organization. So even J.J. Reddick, the irony of it is, <laughs> before he became the coach, when he was an analyst, he actually went on and said the Lakers job would not be a good job to take mm -hmm. until they get into the modern NBA. In other words, this is an antiquated franchise that's still running on old principles. Now, he thinks he's going to come in here and make it new and do everything with math and metrics and analytics and all that. But even he wasn't immune to saying the Lakers are not what the Lakers used to be. And now he's the new coach. So, uh, yeah, they're getting spurned by coaches. They, had had tr they got their assistant coaches now in McMillan and Brooks, but they had had trouble. Dwayne Casey pulled out as an assistant coach. Terry Stotts has turned them down reportedly two or three times. Um, so they've had trouble even adding assistant coaches. So, yeah, to your point, the Lakers are not if, – if they're not a bad place to be, they're sort of just like any other team. So, like, are we sitting here talking about, you know, that the Bucks missed out on a particular free agent or the Nuggets? Um, no. 29 teams missed out on only one team gets each player. It's, uh, the, the Lakers used to think of themselves as different than the other 29 teams, and, and uh, they don't appear to be. They're, they're getting passed up on by a lot of people. Clay Thompson had every reason to go to the Lakers. Mm -hmm. With his father there, he's, you know, and he apparently they even offered him more money. Mm -hmm. And now... No one knows the total details, but if he took less money to go to Dallas, yeah, that's indictment might be the only word for the Lakers. Listen, Dallas is not a bad place to be. I'm a little biased, as you know, but uh, we're excited to have Clay Thompson. That's a good signing. That's uh, a good signing. I know. We're very excited. I wish we were talking about that. Uh, if we pivot and continue our West Coast conversation mm -hmm. here, we move down and we'll talk about the Kings, who you yes. said we talked yes. about earlier. Um, the Kings are, they're so interesting to me. They remind me a lot of the Cowboys fan base, where it's like, we're not doing any moves in the offseason. Nothing's happening. What are we doing? Are we getting better? That's sort of what we've seen out of the Kings, where they're not really, haven't done anything to this point in free agency, but there's some big names out there. You mentioned DeMar DeRozan earlier. Lori Markkinen is also another guy who could be on the move. Yes. Uh, you know, when you look at what the Kings were able to do last season and in years past, what are they missing? Which of these free agents do you think would help them be a little bit more successful, especially with where they're competing in the Western Conference? Well, the the, the big play, I, I just mentioned that I think uh, DeMar DeRozan the reporting is now maybe he's headed for Miami, but he, until that happens, the Kings are believed to be in play. Uh, they're believed to be in play for Laurie Markin, and these are, these are trades. Um, Brandon Ingram is one that you didn't mention. He's probably going to get moved. Um, the Kings, to me, you know, in your in your... Cowboys analogy the Kings to me feel more like the Texans of, te okay. of Texas because like the the Warriors and the Lakers are the, are the Cowboys of California and Nobody thinks about the Kings and yet they're one of the most exciting young teams They got Malik Monk back on a really team-friendly deal He could have gone out and gotten more money as a free agent, but he stayed in Sacramento He likes what they're building. He likes playing alongside De'Aaron Fox that Tyrese Halliburton trade Halliburton's the better player, but bringing in DeMontis Sabonis to stabilize that situation in, in Sacramento made them a winner. If you get one more piece, which Sacramento is in the running to do, and, and I mean a real piece, Ingram, Markinen, DeRozan, these are big guys that can help that team right now. This becomes a team that can flirt with a top four, pit, uh, a top four finish in the Western Conference. So to me, they're really interesting because they're so easy to forget. But then you go take a look at them, and it's like De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Keegan Murray, Kevin Herter is attractive to a lot of different teams in terms of a trade chip, Malik Monk. Uh, they've got a very talented roster, and they could be somebody that could surprise a lot of teams if they are able to make this one last move this summer. My fiance would be sad to know that they are the irrelevant little brother there in California. <laughs> they as the they Kings. are. They <laughs> are. I'm from Northern California, and the Kings are. True story. My first Kings game that I ever went was the first NBA game I ever went to, and I don't want to come off like a liar on TV here, but it was one of Michael Jordan's. I got to go see the Bulls, and I feel like it was one of the only games he didn't score 10 points. <laughs> and I remember nobody went to Kings games to watch the Kings. It was for the other players, and and Michael Jordan like had a bum game and. I never forgot that. <laughs> Even Michael Jordan <laughs> making the Kings irrelevant. Oh, my gosh. So uh, it's interesting, though, because the Kings actually knocked out the Warriors in the play-in last year. Again, something maybe a lot of 
fans and people in the NBA don't think about. But uh, for the Warriors, we know right now that they are, you know, for lack of better terms, mourning the loss of Klay Thompson. Obviously, him going to Dallas. The Warriors not having the season that we are expected to see. Uh, they are in talks right now to do a trade with Buddy Heald mm -hmm. with the 76ers. Yes. I'm just curious your thoughts there because to me, it feels like a good fit for, you know, a shooter for a shooter, so to speak, when you yeah. think about what Klay Thompson does. But also the bigger question here, Brad, mm -hmm. is the dynasty done if you don't replace what Klay Thompson could Oh, offer? yeah, the dynasty. Dynasty is a big word. So dynasty is done. You know, whether they can put themselves back in sort of that middle ground contenders level, that's still viable in my mind. Um, the, the Warriors have actually done pretty good work this summer. It feels like a bust because they lost a franchise icon in Klay Thompson. They struck out on a Paul George trade, uh, reportedly. But they've quietly, what we just talked about with the Lakers and their inability to outfit around the edges of their roster, the Warriors have brought in De'Anthony Melton. They brought in Kyle Anderson. And if they get Buddy Heald, uh, they're effectively going to pay Anderson and Heald, assuming they get him, with the Klay Thompson traded player exception. So Heald and Kyle Anderson together are better than Klay Thompson. And De'Anthony Melton is a big upgrade from Chris Paul. Uh, they've upgraded their defensive versatility. They've gotten themselves a nice little playmaker uh, in Kyle Anderson that can sort of operate as an offensive hub and can also defend. Um, and then Buddy Heald can probably replace, to some degree, Klay Thompson shooting. So the big splash play is also still in effect for the Warriors. They're one of... Uh, the leading contenders for a Laurie Markkinen trade. If you look around the reporting that's, that's, that's around this situation right now, the Warriors are trying to have to decide uh, if they want to give up, because they're dealing with Danny Ainge. Mm -hmm. And Danny Ainge knows a desperate animal when he sees it, and he's going to make them give up the bank. But if they're willing to, to cash in a lot of, of future draft picks um, and then sign Markkinen to a long-term extension, and Markkinen is willing to take a little bit less than he could probably get if he stays in Utah because of the Warriors cap situation and apron situation, um, they can get him. They can put together a real package. And now, if the Warriors sign Laurie Markin in, in addition to those peripheral parts that I just mentioned, this actually would be kind of a home run summer. Are they back to being like a top level title contender? No, but they're at least doing justice to the end of Steph Curry's prime and giving him a viable team to go out and compete with. Yeah, that was going to be my last question, but you answered it. I was going to ask about Steph, but that's all we got. That's all he needs. It's just a, just give the guy a chance, and, and he can, just don't make him go out on a play-in team. Yeah, definitely. Brad Botkin joining us to discuss all the latest in NBA free agency. Brad, thank you for hopping on with us once again here on HQ. When we take a look at the odds to win the upcoming NBA title next season, the Kings are not on this list. Sorry, Marcel. Uh, maybe next year. But uh, the Celtics are. They have the shortest odds at plus 300 to win again. The new look 76ers also on there at plus 850. Uh, the Warriors and the Lakers both may be in the conversation. 3,400 and 3,500 respectfully.